All right, thanks, Stephen. Uh, we're going to, we have folks gathering uh, today at the uh, August 2022, this is August 13th, 2022, uh, Columbus Free Press Salon. Um, I'm Mark Stansbury, um, one of the board members. And we, we, we're uh, today attempting to uh, cover some very big topics that we believe are pillars in the movement towards building a multiracial, multinational, multicultural movement uh, that is in stark contrast to where we are at the status quo, where healthcare and housing are not guaranteed, um, where racists are, are running amok, um, attacking officialdom, <laughs> uh, running amok. So we'll talk more about that. Uh, so again, this is the Free Press, August Free Press Salon. We, we're happy to welcome um, uh, representatives of SPAN Ohio, that single payer action network. And I'll let them describe that whole effort that's been going on for many years. But um, so uh, Bob Grasson and doc, uh, Dr. Alice Farina are gonna be sharing some uh, uh, information and updating us on their movement, our movement for um, healthcare, you know, universal healthcare is one aspect of it. Uh, uh, we can talk about all the different concerns, but healthcare and medical care uh, are definitely uh, reasons for economic poverty for many families. Uh, so it is very important, very important topic. So thank you, uh, Dr. Alice and Bob for coming and giving us a little update on where SPAN is and what, what, what our options are. So you can unmute and head on. This is like Jeopardy. We have a special game today with people gathered from all over the country to participate in final Jeopardy because you've all been successful in the game this far. So welcome, good to have you as players. Our final uh, game will ask you to write your answer uh, and your wager on a piece of paper and you'll have 30 seconds to answer the question. The final Jeopardy answer is US legislation that would enable all residents to receive lifetime comprehensive necessary medical care and pays 100% of the cost. I'll read it again. US legislation that would enable all residents to receive lifetime comprehensive necessary medical care and pays 100% of the cost. 30 seconds. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, time's up. Show us your answers. Or maybe I'll just ask that question. Okay, the response to US legislation that would enable all residents to receive lifetime comprehensive, comprehensive necessary medical care and pays 100% of the cost. Did anybody have the correct answer? Speak up. I had single payer health care. The name of the legislation is Medicare for All. Medicare for All. HR 1976 and Senate Bill 4204. Did anybody get that? Uh, well, there you are. Medicare for all, thank you, the game was good. It's now over. <laughs> Medicare for all is not standard Medicare applied to everybody. That's what I hear from everybody. Oh, it's just standard Medicare that's applied to everyone. Um, standard Medicare only pays for 80% of necessary medical care. Uh, individuals need to pay 20% uh, 
um, uh, need to pay 20% out of pocket or have a Medigap policy or have Medicare Advantage, both of which require co-pays and deductibles. Standard Medicare does not pay for dental, hearing, vision, needed medications or long-term care, while Medicare for all does. Doctors would not need prior authorization, nor would any doctor be out of network in Medicare for all. Patients would never see a medical bill. So doctor's offices and hospitals could close their patient billing departments. You could see any doctor. Currently, that's a choice in standard Medicare, but not Medicare Advantage. Notice in this sign, it says improved and expanded Medicare, Medicare for all. It is not the same as standard Medicare. And if I don't leave you with any other message, that's the one to remember. This is not the, the regular old Medicare. This is a whole new deal. And I'm proud to say new deal because that's where it comes from, the new deal. Alice is going to follow up with some other information. Thank you, Alice. Okay. Um, did Were you able to see the, the flyer that I had up for Bob? No, I didn't see it, but maybe others did. It, it said you were about to share, but it never came up. So I don't know. Oh, well, let, let me again quickly try to share it. Please. Can you see it? No. It's something's not happening. Send it to me if you could. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to see if I can. It says I am screen sharing, and I don't know why it doesn't show up. Let me see if I can show what I want to show. Um, basically, I just want to tell you what has been holding it up. Um, let me see here. Alice, after you hit share your screen, then it brings you up some options of what it is you're gonna share. So you have to hit something after that too, hit the um, picture of what yeah, it is. I've been, I've been able to show before and uh, does this show up? It says you're screen sharing, but I don't know if you've, cho did you choose the flyer as the image that you want us to see? It, it's open on my desktop and when I, uh, well, it disappeared again. Anyway, um, I'm going to give up on that. Otherwise, we'll be here forever. So I just want to tell you why it's been held up. Uh, it's been held up because of powerful lobbyists who have a lot of money to stop it. And Big Pharma is the biggest one. Uh, and the private insurance companies are the next big one. So the cost for health care in the United States said it exceeds by wide margin the cost for all other developed countries. 23 countries spend more than $3,000 on healthcare per capita based on 2018 data. And the eight countries that spend the most are the following. The United States, which spends 10,586. That's followed by Switzerland that spends 7,317. Norway at a little over 6,000, Germany at almost 6,000, Sweden at a little over 5,000 per capita. Remember, we're spending 10,586 per capita. And Austria uh, and Denmark and the 5,000s, oh, and Netherlands. So we are about double most of the other major um, industrialized nations. So co-pays and deductibles were introduced into our system, not only in the private insurance, system, but actually in Medicare as well. It was in introduced because they perceived that over overutilization was what was driving the cost. But Americans actually utilize healthcare services less than is the case in other countries and patient cost sharing blocks access to vital care. If your deductible is very high, you try to avoid using medical services. Cost sharing has not been effective at containing with system-wide costs. And that's because in a system where 
collecting and tracking co-payments and deductibles entail the substantial administrative cost and effort. So as Bob told you, a single payer national health plan would cover every American for all necessary medical services without co-pays and deductibles, and it would still be less costly than our current system. So that's all I have to say. I'm sorry I wasn't able to screen share. It said I was. <laughs> I'll have to. Great. Thanks so much, Alice. Um, I'm going to send this to Mark. Hopefully, Mark, you can bring up the picture I just sent you. We're looking at the SPAN website, right? Yeah. OK. Um, new and improved expanded Medicare for All uh, has benefits. And the benefits are one, you are covered from birth until death. You never have to renew it. You're always in it. You're always in it. You're covered regardless of your work or your financial status. Your includes dental, vision, hearing, women's health, mental health, long-term health, prescriptions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a long list of et ceteras. You can see any health care provider, any hospital, doctor, or licensed medical provider. Fear of seeing a doctor because of cost is gone. 68,000 Americans won't die needlessly because they can't afford medical care. That's a number for each year, 68,000. And we all save money. Taxation will be less than the current premiums and out-of-pocket expenses. Price negotiation, no, that's not it. 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 <laughs> Sorry about that. You can take that down. Um, we all save money. Taxation will be less than current premiums and out-of-pocket expenses. Price negotiation with medical providers will reduce costs by 20%. Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid services, CMS will be doing the negotiation. Public schools, you know, we have a strike ready to happen in Columbus. You know, if you took 15% um, of payroll or 18% of payroll out of their costs because they had Medicare for all, the strike would probably not happen. They will all have money to improve their services. They probably won't need a tax raise either. Labor unions wouldn't negotiate, need, wouldn't need to bargain for health care. They can focus on working conditions and everything else that labor unions do. And this is a real kicker that Alice uh, was part of her financial arrangement. 65, 650,000 Americans. 650,000 Americans won't go bankrupt each year because of medical debt. Medical Medicare for all will reduce poverty by increasing disposable income. In 2000, or excuse me, 1965, when Medicare was started, 30% um, uh, of seniors lived in poverty. In 2017, that number was 9%. So if Medicare could increase disposable income for seniors by that amount, imagine what Medicare for all would do for all of us. Thank you for listening. God's spirit be with you all. If you have questions, please shout them out. Thank you, thank you, Bob and uh, Dr. Alice for your information. Uh, Joe had his hand up and uh, we'll probably do some quick uh, clarification questions right now and then we'll have discussion a little bit later. We'd like to keep moving uh, we, um, with some other uh, topics as well. So uh, Joe, did you have something quick you wanna- Yeah, I'm I was just wondering if uh, everyone had an opportunity to call one of those uh... Uh, 800 numbers uh, to check your zip code. 
if you sign up with uh, one of those companies, uh, they'll get you really good deals on prescriptions. And, you know, I've been on Medicare for, for a few years, and I think maybe one or two of us, other people may be on Medicare. But anyway, if you sign up for those, uh, they're the the co-pays are extremely low and I've, I've been pretty happy with them so far. But the thing is, if you go in the hospital, I think that's when they really hit you up for, for a big bill. That's all I had to say, but yeah, I, I'd, I'd check yeah. one of those out. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the concept that Bob and Dr. Alice are talking about, and please, you guys chime in is that Medicare is a good system. They want to expand it to include more. And, and and pay for more people you know drop it down for everybody is what they're thinking but you know we know that politically it might be down to 50 it could get to 50 who knows but yeah yeah the, the, the way it's been for the corporations the gut for every every month the government will give the the insurance company like 800 more than 800 dollars right. for each person they sign up for these He's you're talking approach. you're talking about the medicare advantage plans yeah exactly i happen to be in traditional medicare and i'm clinging to it with my fingernails because yeah. i don't want to be put in a, an advantage plan because i don't want them choosing my doctor oh, no yeah. there's, there's the other the other, the there's other thing is let me joe let her let her talk and that yeah i hear your i hear your concern and and we're going to not get into a Medicare Advantage Medicare discussion today. Yeah, that could be something that let's let's yeah, article yeah, let's do an yeah. article on that. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I want to say it's a big windfall for insurance companies. Yeah, it is. Thank you. So yeah, the, the, there's this discussion. This is why we have been going on with this discussion for so long on on healthcare is that folks have different perceptions on what is going to make healthcare better. We are uh, victims of a system that's not a system. We have uh, healthcare <laughs> plans, insurance plans that are out there that do not relate very well to uh, medical and or health care. And I like dividing the two. Medical and health care are very two different entities. And, and when we're talking a larger discussion of health, um, let's always remember that when you're talking about covering hospital and all that other stuff, that's medical and that's big money, big money. The health stuff, you know, staying healthy and, and, and covering preventative kind of stuff is, is a small money uh, when you really talk about it. So, um, Dr. Alice, Bob, do you want to maybe conclude on, on this and then we'll move on to the uh, surgical presentation? I don't have anything more. Okay, no, thank you very much. Uh, Winnie, hello. Yeah, I'd like to say, I think we should stop calling it um, health insurance because health insurance is an investment instrument to, for uh, the 1% and they are invested in healthcare. And for instance, they're invested in pharmaceuticals, but then they make $5 billion of profit off of them. So they are not in the business of providing good, needed goods they would not be making $5 billion worth of profits. They would be providing medicines for like insulin for free. So we should have a different name that we start calling it. Like when your doctor asks you, what is your health insurance company? You say, my investment company for the 1% is United Healthcare. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so Span Ohio, the look up their website, they've been very active and, and are all across Ohio. And actually, mm -hmm. um, Span Ohio was a model for to go a network of activity activists on healthcare across this, the country. And um, so the demand right now within Span Ohio, I believe, is Medicare for all. Uh, and that it expanded and 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 better <laughs> and better. Um, so thank you, uh, uh, Will. You, I saw that you posted that you said that we should just all go for comprehensive Medicare for all. Go ahead, Will. Well, I think the important part of that is that that um, you know personally, I have Medicare, but I also have a um, an extra policy that I get through my retirement from you guessed it, Abbott Laboratories, a pharmaceutical company. But by the same token. 
Uh, even though I, I'm but sorry, you earned that. You Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I'm not going to apologize for it. Right. Uh, no, you, don't. you don't apologize but, for anything you earned. <laughs> but by the same token, I don't know how that's going to affect me because I was in the hospital for four days in June with bacterial pneumonia. Uh, I am still positive for COVID. Uh, I'm on my eighth day. So hopefully that's going to come to an end pretty time or pretty soon. But there's going to be doctors, uh, all kinds of doctor bills that are connected with that. The only thing that comes out free is the uh, medication for uh, COVID because that's all covered under, you know, government policy. I've, I'm taking the uh, no antiviral uh, Paxlovid. And in fact, I'm getting ready to take my very last dosage of that. And I'll be glad to get rid of it because the side effects on that are just, it's unbelievable. But I, but I do think it's, it's helping me. But I, I, I encourage people to hang on. If you've got uh, the, the, the uh, traditional government Medicare insurance coverage, hold on to that. Don't, I mean, make them peel that from your cold, dead hands. Uh, that is so important to get drawn away from that is, is just, it's dangerous. So that's, that's all I had to say. That's a, that's a, that's a great, uh, uh, closing uh, argument for uh, let's let's make sure if you got it hold on to it and uh, and 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 organize remember we we have a, a a rush to the bottom mentality with healthcare they I don't have it so you don't deserve it type of attitude instead of saying they got it I should get it it's a whole different way and as Winnie said we need to reframe our arguments and our discussions on the policies that we are demanding and and we will demand especially as we get older we are going to demand you know health care because that will be a cost that's a life uh life quality of life issue that we need to understand especially at older but younger as well so um Thank you. So we're, we're going to move into uh, Jenny's presentation. Do you want me to just start with the video first? Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. S Alice and Bob. Uh, yeah, you want to start just straight with the. the sure. If you, yeah, you can, that would be fine, Mark. If you can do that, thank you. And then I'll talk about it. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just see a quick video here, if I can do it real quick here. Um, bah, 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 pop. There we go this up okay so this is a video that it, it's from a webinar that we're going to uh, share with everybody um in the report out but this is a short part of it so about four minutes three minutes everybody good i grew up on a small family tobacco farm in rural eastern kentucky too many times people are telling folks in my community, people who are trying to just make it every day to put food on their tables, a roof over their head, telling them to blame each other, to blame black and brown people for their suffering instead of those at the top, billionaires, crooked politicians, and big businesses who do nothing but exploit the people, the land, and our labor. We know that it is a strategy by those in power, those at the top, to get white folks, and especially poor and working class white folks like my family, me, my community, to side with other white people who do not have their interests at heart instead of black and brown working class folks. And they do that very strategically and focused because they know that there's so many of us, white, black, and brown, poor, working class people, in this country that us all coming together would outnumber them. White anti-racist Southerner Ann Braden used to tell us, we're not here because we're helping black people or people of color. We're here because our lives depend on getting in this fight. And I think we can all see those people who went before us as some of the roots, as some of the anchors that hold us and carry us in this work. Almost 55 years ago, there was a call from the Black Liberation Movement for white people to go and organize our own. 
There is no way that we can make the change that is needed in this country unless we move more white people to understand that a black, brown, and indigenous vision for change in this country is exactly what we need in our lives. And it's on us to bring in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, actually millions of white people all over this country if we're going to shift things. White supremacist movements didn't just happen. They're part of a long strategy. White people, our people, are being actively recruited. Our opponents are organizing white people all the time. Mm -hmm. They're stoking white fear and racism so they can stay in power and prevent all of us from getting the things we need, health care, better schools, safe housing. And I know it doesn't have to be this way. That's what I'm figuring out as part of showing up for racial justice understanding a shared interest and a shared purpose. And when we find our stake, we find our voice and we find our power. Showing up for racial justice is actually the largest explicit organizing project to mobilize white people for racial justice in the history of this country. Nine, we've been bringing our people into multiracial fights for justice across the country. All right. Thank, thank you. So Jenny Volz is a, a member and, and a proud uh, worker of, of um, Surge, and I guess it's now called Surge Co., and she can explain the difference uh, of what's going on. And thank you, uh, Jenny, for joining up. Uh, but remember, I've seen some chat talk about healthcare, and remember, we as a community are seeking folks to write articles for free press. We are a community of activists, but we want to document our, our movements in, in, within the network that free press is. So we have radio, podcasts, articles need to be written so that we can get them out. And we're not talking just locally, we're talking across the nation, around the world that we have access to and, and put components for. So please, write articles as you can, send them to Suzanne. And Jenny, thank you for joining us tonight. Well, thank you very much. It's my privilege. Uh, hello, everybody. And thank you, Mark, for figuring out how to show that video. Uh, it's brand new from Surge National. And it says in a very short time, better than I could, what Surge is about. Surge has been in existence since 2009. Surge Co. means showing up for ju uh, racial justice, Central Ohio. So uh, that's what we are. We used to be Surge Columbus and we couldn't stand that name, so we changed it. So we uh, are, uh, as everybody knows, in the, the uprisings, the Black Lives Matter uprisings of 2020 were powerful. And we were very involved in that. We had, in, and in many things, working in, concert with black led organizations prior to that in Columbus prior to that. Uh, and yet the response by uh, the police and uh, people in authority after that was very powerful and very violent. Uh, and things that have been happening since then that are extremely frightening and disturbing all over this country. Uh, and so, things got pretty quiet during the pandemic and now we are reorganizing and beginning to recruit white people again to join us in Surge Co to begin to make um, some make some moves and make some action. I'm not talking about demonstrations, I'm talking about productive projects that begin to unite people. Um, we are working uh, on a, a project called alternatives to calling the police. Everybody knows the harm that comes to some people when police are called. And uh, specifically those people are often black and brown people. And in Columbus, that's been a very severe problem. So we are collecting stories uh, by people like us who may have resisted calling the police when, you know, we are trained, we've been imprinted with 
something happens, we white people call the police. We're safe. It doesn't, you know, nothing happens to us. And yet off, a huge amount of harm can come to someone else who uh, is not uh, white. So we're trying to help people think about uh, a different way of thinking about it and a different way of reacting and responding. Uh, and we are also working with the Columbus Safety Collective, uh, who is uh, with finding resources that do not are not connected with the police. And one thing they are working on is a non-police re crisis response team. And they're trying to get funding for that to go out to help people who are having mental health crises. So if anyone has a story about a time in their lives when they called called the police or didn't call the police, we are looking for those stories because we really want to begin to reach out to the community and than you might think because the situation or is it our bias that's coming up that is uh, making us have that kind of response. Uh, so uh, that's one of the things, one of the teams that, and projects that we're working on. We have a communications team. Another one that we might be developing if we get enough help is beginning to move wealth from white people to uh, black led organizations. Um, that is, uh, you know, plenty of white people have plenty of money. They would be happy to do something with it if they knew what to do. And our white wealth needs to start to be moved to black communities and black, black uh, groups. So that might be one of our projects uh, in the near future if we can get some um, interest in that. Um, I'd like to ask if people have questions. I'd like this to be a conversation if possible, but I didn't like Thank you, and and stay on, and we'll we'll continue this conversation. But yes, the the the, the importance of the work that Serge has done. That's it, we've really appreciated the work, and and continue to uh, understand why CO is now put a part of the. Uh, yeah, we we all all are trying to rue the fact that we are in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, David, I saw your name. I hand up first, and then Bob, and then anybody else. Uh, we'll probably get female after that if. And, and, and really, um, it was just a, a comment and a compliment, Jimmy. Um, Serge, we're, you know, starting, starting in the uprising, Serge did a lot of reconnaissance and diversion and frontline stuff that we needed, 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 needed. And I'm, I'm glad to see that you're looking at things on a back end too because i'm used to seeing surge as they're like uh um the ara right anti-racist action folks right where it's they can come out in force and make a lot of noise but i didn't i wasn't aware that you were doing trainings on ideology and moving money because all of those yeah. things are very very important so Thanks. thank you Jenny, do you want to respond to that, or uh, we can move well, on? Well, I, I, I said thank you, and yes, we are. We're, we're not wanting to wait to be reactive. We want to be proactive, and we want to bring people together so that to prevent uh, the kind of direction that we see this country going in. Do you see a, a, a bank of some sort that would be like an activist bank of some sort that would be developed or how would you how would you describe the fund? You know, because I, I see that how Women's Fund is doing a similar kind of behavior um, of collecting money to help people get to access uh, health care when they need it. Um, uh, uh, we don't, we don't want to become holders of money. We want to help people, to educate people and help them to directly fund uh, local uh, groups that are BIPOC led. And so what we see ourselves more is like a, not a conduit, but more of a referral system. So we know who the groups are. We put people in touch with them. Thanks. So it's direct. Yeah. Yeah, Columbus is blessed with many good organizations that are doing great work. Bob, did you, you, I see your chat that you, you wanted to say something about the first, first shift uh, effort that the CDB is doing. Yes, as a volunteer for suicide prevention, 
I have always been leery of calling the police yes. to intervene in a suicide prevention call. Black Lives Matter triggered a change at the Columbus Police Department that I learned about maybe a month or two months ago that they have instituted a pilot program which the officer in leadership that I talked to said is now covering just about the entire first shift of the Columbus Police Department. And that program has a social worker riding with a police officer to respond to mental health emergencies. I don't know how the, all the emergencies are handled, but uh, suicide prevention is part of the medical mental health emergencies. Uh, and it has been very well received and they are trying to expand it into the second shift. Uh, I think that's a remarkable change and I sure think that's where I, I, I take my hat off to Black Lives Matter for triggering it because it was in a sense defunding the police and replacing it with a humane response to healthcare. Uh, Bob, I, in response to that, I know about that. Uh, I have uh, heard about its development. It started out at four hours. Now they're, they're funding it, it should expand. Uh, we are leery of the fact that police are present at all. Uh, one of the people we heard from recently was the sister of Duran Thomas, who was known to the police and who was having a mental health crisis and they beat him to death. The police beat him to death. We think that there can be other people, other types of people with lived experience, mental health professionals who would be better to respond to mental health crises. You don't need an armed killer to go to help somebody prevent suicide. That's our opinion. Well, thank, thank you, Jenny. Um, any, I'd see Will, but anyone else that <laughs> want to offer? Go ahead, Will, and then we'll. That's we'll... fine. I, I, I get it. <laughs> oh, go hey, ahead. Go ahead. The, the point I was wanting to make is that back in the day, when I was active with the Green Party here in Columbus. And I remember that we had a statewide convention or something like that. And, and it was funny because, you know, it, they had developed these, these caucuses and, then, and we were breaking up into these caucus, individual caucuses. Well, this was shortly after Trump had been elected. And I thought, you know, maybe I need to learn a little bit about what's going on with you know, uh, human relations and black relations and, and the whole concept. So I joined the black caucus, not because I thought I had something to contribute because what do I know about what an average black person goes through? I, I, I have no idea of what their life is like. So I went in with the, the very intention of just listening. And I think my point is that I think think is one of the problems that white people have more than anything else is the inability to listen. Uh, I don't know that this is the time to be open our mouths up about some ideas as how to solve the problem because we have not lived that life and we just need to, to, to lear, uh, hear the stories of the people who have gone through that and then, you know, give them the support that they, they have. I, I just, I, 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 my, my bottom line is that I think that uh, even organizations like Surge need to really put uh, a real emphasis on white people developing their ability to learn. God gave us one mouth, but he gave us two ears. So yeah. we, 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 we just need to start listening. And I think if we listen, we'll, we'll, that, that uh, benevolent uh, urge in our bodies and our souls will come out and, and uh, try to become a help to that. Okay. Thanks, Will. That's... Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, thank you uh, for uh, updating us on Surge Co. now, Surge Co. Um, and I appreciate the, the, the adjustment to Central Ohio. That, that's fantastic. Um, and <laughs> we're all bringing up issues uh, within our own minds of why things aren't working, um, uh, but there is a, it, 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 there is a social there are social factors 
that have been driving racial divide, class divide um, uh, issues. And that's why we wanted to move into a little bit of the housing subject and to start talking a little bit about uh, what Camp Shameless has been trying to do. For uh, I've come to know Elizabeth uh, from her days when she was uh, housed up at Old First during the winter, and then uh, they moved out in September in the springtime to set up Camp Shameless. And so their work continues, and um, even if the camp comes to a destructive, I'm sure that community will be doing what it needs to do. So Winnie was going to introduce Elizabeth and anybody else that's in the, the circuit that's going to talk and update us. And then the conversation is going to get live. We're going to really try to uh, say, how can the free press community respond to what's going on uh, with this camp? So, uh, Winnie, do you want to start? You said you're going to start and introduce Elizabeth, or I, how are you guys going to do it? Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I just want to give a few facts and figures to put the issue in perspective. And these um, facts and figures raise more questions than they answer. First of all, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development says that they conduct a one day snapshot survey in 3,000 communities, uh, cities in, in America says that there's about 2,000 homeless people in Columbus, 1,500, 75% uh, of them are do access shelters to sleep in, 400 are unsheltered, and those are the ones we're talking about today, tonight, and 150 only are in transitional housing. I assume that's their, their they have a caseworker and they're going to move into their own apartment at a later time. But that number is very deceptive. For instance, um, the federal government says there's 12,000 homeless people in Ohio, yet Ohio, the state of Ohio says 700,000 people access homeless services. And that's because a lot of people are doubled up. They, are, they lost their housing, but they have friends and relatives to um, double up with, but they still can't afford to eat. So they go to the, to the soup kitchens. And um, so this is a very, this is a national problem. It's, it's very extreme on the West Coast and, and gentrification is cited as a major reason because of like um, Google will move in and then there'll be a lot of people with hundred uh, six figure salaries and the neighborhoods are gentrified and the poor people do not have a place to live. And I see that happening in Columbus. And we have Intel moving in, it will only get worse. And, but uh, they, the whole fact about the Medicare for all, a lot of people are homeless because of the lack of medical care. We have people who suffer generational and systemic poor health and life outcomes because they have a mental illness or um, addiction or uh, domestic violence and trauma that is untreated. They have poor nutrition because of the lack of being able to afford, afford food. And so these are health problems that the lack of medical care is causing homelessness. There's also um, a lot of children in foster care who when they age out, they don't have families to support them. And there's women and children. Again, it's a uh, lack of services who are escaping domestic violence and they end up homeless. So we have to wonder why. Um, so the Community Shelter Board in Columbus is the overarching agency that has, uh, oversees 16 different agencies and funnels federal and state money. And they have a $50 million operating budget. And I'm not sure if that's for all the agencies, the, all the money that they give out, or if it's just for them, but they have 34 employees and they're going to hire, they use the um, American Rescue Plan money to, they're gonna train and hire 37 new mental health interventionists. And yet there's still 2000 people that they're um, with all that money that they can't accommodate. And I see them as being reactive instead of proactive. They're not addressing the causes and conditions. They're just putting a bandaid on the people after they um, have been abandoned for years on end. An another question that we have is that $60,000 was spent to clean up Hare Park and one other homeless camp, $60,000 to, 
to the Environmental Reclamation Services, and we just wonder whether they gave a donation to the mayor or city council. So these are just some of the questions that I have had about uh, in my research on homelessness. So the reason um, Camp Shameless came about was in the summer, I mean, in the winter, when it got below 24 degrees, Gary Whitty has a long history of advocating for the homeless. In fact, he's famous for having gotten arrested in Kasich's office in DC um, to try to get the first funding for the per, first public um, shelter. Uh, advocated at uh, Church for All People on Parsons and Old First Presbyterian to open their churches uh, for as warming stations. And there was an open shelter uh, um, on Parsons Avenue that had been moved. It was originally in Franklinton and was an overnight shelter, but the city, the wisdom, in the wisdom of the city fathers, they first moved it downtown to St. John's where a person froze to death on the steps because they didn't allow it to have overnight shelter. And then they had it on Parsons Avenue. So Church for All People had up to 90 people sleeping on the floor last winter. So this is just a snapshot of the failure of City Hall to address the needs of the people. So um, Elizabeth Blackburn was um, uh, lit on fire to, to run the, the um, warming station. And when spring came, she helped the people to relocate uh, next to, but not on, um, if you know where um, the Four Seasons City Farm, there's, a, there's several more vacant lots on Mound Street. And uh, she is, has modeled her camp after others that I see online that are self-governing and it's really very exciting. And she's gotten great coverage, two big articles in the dispatch. And so Elizabeth, if you'd like to tell about your experience. Thank you so much, Winnie. Um, yeah, like, like Winnie said, and like Mark said, um, the Camp Shameless community started as a warming station uh, out of Old First Presbyterian at Ohio and Bryden. Um, it was run by the first collective volunteers. Um, the first collective was started by, by Gary Whitty and David Harewood, who are both on this call. Um, volunteers saw an opportunity to do something to help, and so we did. Um, we continued to run the warming station after the Church for All People station closed on February 27th. Uh, our warming station ran until March 29th. Um, at that point, we were uh, no longer able to run the station out of the church, so we moved outside. Um, we were running on a shoestring budget, because it was my budget. Uh, <laughs> uh, didn't have outside funding, didn't receive support from the city. Um, so I went out and bought tents and volunteers donated so many supplies. Um, came and helped. We, we had a lot of volunteers, especially in the early days there, constantly just to help make sure people had what they need. Um, it was still really cold, so we, we had heaters. Um, but since then, since March 29th, uh, Camp Shameless has continued to operate on the, the two lots on Mound Street. You can find us at uh, 905 East Mound. Um, I have a couple of years I wanted to share. Um, let me share my screen and see how this goes. Uh, Did we give the Elizabeth the, the right to do that or the ability to do that, Stephen? If you could quickly, thank you. I think I can. Let's see. One moment. I love the fact that you have an address. <laughs> Yes, we, uh, we installed a mailbox. You'll, you'll see that in the tour video. I, know. I, I love the fact that. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. Um, I'm going to share a video of uh, one of our volunteers, Matina. Uh, this was recorded this morning. Um, so I'll give you a little view. Yeah, it's wonderful. I, I, don't, I can wait, Gary. Hey, come back. Hey, Carrie, come and see the video. Come here. <laughs> Winnie. <laughs> You're unmuted. Uh, here's uh, so here's Matina with a little bit more. 
Hi there, my name is Matina. I am a volunteer with um, First Collective in Camp Shameless and I kind of just wanted to talk about how Camp Shameless and what First Collective is doing with Camp Shameless is different than any other unhoused encampment you've seen here in Columbus or probably around the state of Ohio. Um, for example, just this morning we had a camp cleanup. So we do this every Saturday at 10 and it's just a time where volunteers and residents come together to clean up the common spaces and in the few hours that we were here this morning cleaning up the camp and reorganizing things and making sure that this is a clean and as safe as possible home for our 12 to 15 residents here at um, currently um, we had people stop by someone brought chicken burritos for everyone and peaches and cookies and food not bombs stopped by and brought various other treats for us as well um, and our neighbors stopped by and they had a bite to eat with us and we just were able to like share time together and talk about you know issues that we're all facing and um, have a nice time together and share food and resources and that's something that we do here at Camp Shameless all the time is if we have an excess of donations from community members our neighbors in the community are open to it and they come by often and share things that we have if they have excess food they bring it to us and it's just like a sharing of resources it's a community that's working together to make sure that we're meeting each other's needs and it's honestly really beautiful and amazing and there's a lot of good stuff happening here at Camp Shameless things that we're really proud of um, and things that aren't being provided by other services or the government or um, city funded programs right so while living in a tent may not be the most ideal situation, at least we're making the best of the situation that we currently have. And we're working hard together as a community to meet the needs of our residents and meet the need of the greater community um, on the Near East side. Um, and this can be normal. Like, if the community was more open to, you know, being friendly with the unhoused and working with the unhoused, um, Maybe it wouldn't, it wouldn't feel that they had to set up camps under bridges or on abandoned railroad tracks or like in the tree lines that's like pretty far away from the road. We're out here in the open, people know we're here, we're in a neighborhood and it's been going really well. And it's been a really, really amazing project to be a part of. And I'm really looking forward to the work that we continue doing. Even though we are facing an eviction right now, we know that this work is really important. And we know that like this could model what other camps look like in the intermediary while people are waiting for long-term housing solutions. So that was Matina. Uh, she's amazing. She's been one of our main contacts with the city. Um, she actually has a meeting with a, a few organizations on Wednesday. So we're hoping to learn more about the eviction status. Um, as far as what we know now, um, we, we've been, I mean, since the city first made contact with us on April 15th, we've been told one thing and shown another constantly. Um, since the eviction notice, we've received an offer of hotels that was retracted, we've received talk of uh, an extension that was retracted. There's, there's been a lot of back and forth. So right now we're really, really hoping to nail down what our timeline is so that we can better understand you know, what, what we need to do to help keep our residents together, keep them safe and provide them with the resources that they have had access to, continue to make those connections. Um, Thanks. So thank you, and um, continue. Uh, we're we're not we're not done with this con con uh, concern and this discussion because we are, as you say, facing an end of the month uh, eviction for another camp, and the the sweeps that are going across the country on uh, trying to sweep people away um, uh, is not going to work. Um, it, we know that historically, we know it. Um, I understand the Church for All People and several other cool uh, warming stations were trying to get into a conversation, and I don't know where that is at this point. Have you guys been part of those conversations of how to, what are we going to do next winter for uh, warming stations? And I know uh, Church for All People and some other folks are trying to get into um, a lot of different discussions. And, and yes, the city is going to have to be a player if it come dragged or 
or pulled or whatever we got to do to them. Um, and I understood that you guys did have some kind of city folk come out and, and, and originally were saying, here, you get your potties, you get this, that, that some other stuff that they were saying, and then they withdraw, as you say. Um, can you speak a little bit about that, the, along with the conversation of post uh, of coming up? Sure. I mean, um, we've we've talked to the city at length. Uh, we've we presented a proposal to them to uh, uh, continue operating essentially uh, through through December. Um, we asked for funds from the American Rescue Plan, you know, which was meant to help address issues like homelessness. Um, didn't <laughs> receive much. Um, warmth, uh, though we have been asked what what we would suggest and we're trying to continue those conversations as well. Um, I, I think as much as the city has been unwilling to work with us, we, we do recognize that they're the entity that should be taking care of the people. So it's it's important to keep pressing them to do what we said the right thing. Um, I, could I uh, share another video while we're we're talking about this. I wanted to give you a little tour. Yeah, while you're set, yes, while you're setting that up, Franklin <laughs> County, Franklin County, you get, you go ahead and share. As soon as you do, we, I'll stop. But Franklin County's eviction rate is is uh, historical. It's 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 um, amazingly embarrassing. Oh, here we go. Absolutely, it really is. Um, so this, I just want to give you a little tour of the camp. I'll go ahead and mute the video and talk over it. Um, this was before the, the camp cleanup that happened this morning. Uh, things are still pretty messy and they still are pretty messy. It's hard when you live outside, but we, um, we do our best. Um, so this is kind of the before state. This is the structure here that the city is taking such issue with. Um, it was a permanent structure, but it's no longer in the ground. Uh, the, uh, it's just posts and a lean to attached to some pallets. Um, this is one of our supply tents. It was in a pretty sorry state. Um, it got a lot better at the end of the day. Um, but the next part will take you on a little walk through the camp. Some of our signage. Uh, this one's new. You'll see these around town. Um, we've got some signs going up in front of officials' houses and that sort of thing. So <laughs> that's a sign from James Stevens. He's one of our residents. Uh, you'll hear from him before we finish. And there's our Camp Shameless sign that one of our friends painted for us, the mailbox that we installed. Um, <laughs> welcome to our campsite, yes. Uh, hospitality is key at Camp Shameless. Uh, got to go portable sanitation is donating those porta johns. The city had nothing to do with it. And we're paying for our own rumpke service. Um, so it, there was a rumor going around that the city was helping. Uh, there were some uh, solar panels. I moved past that a little fast, but we recently did a solar fundraiser. And so now we're able to run most of our devices and soon that uh, deep freezer over there off of the solar power that we generate every day. There's James Stevens, one of our, one of our longtime residents. He's been with us since the warming station. Um, just more view of the camp. Uh, there's the supply tent that was such a mess earlier. Uh, now it's nice and organized. Things are a lot better. We, we still have some odds and ends we don't know what to do with, but who doesn't? Um, the, the camp has been uh, housed as many as uh, 25 people. Right now it's between 12 and 16. Um, some people are doubled up. Uh, here's a couple tents. Nicely appointed and decorated. Um, we, you know, we try our best to keep the site clean and to be good neighbors. Um, neighborliness is a, is a big part of what's made things work, I think, because honestly, we've never really had problems with uh, the people in the neighborhood. Um, they haven't really had problems with us. Uh, we get along with just about everybody and a lot of folks have stopped by to help out, donated whatever they have in excess walking past my tent. <laughs> um, I have lived at the camp since, basically since it started on March 29th. Um, I 
became housing insecure in the beginning of March when we were still running the warming station. And so uh, it just made sense. <laughs> it was nice that we had a soft place to land. Uh, there's a bike rack that one of our volunteers made. They welded it out of rebar and fixed up several bikes that residents can take out um, and borrow. Uh, peek in my very messy tent. <laughs> but it's, it's not so bad. It's a, it's a cozy place to live. There's a, a dream catcher that one of the residents made for me for my birthday. So yeah, that's the, that's the camp tour. That's Camp Shameless on 905 East Mound Street. Um, stop by sometime during daylight hours, ask for me, and I'd love to give you a tour. Thank you. And yeah, more visits uh, right now will be very important. Um, Ohio, one of the only states in the, in the country that uh, did not forego um, evictions throughout the pandemic. Franklin County, leader of Ohio in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, Cuyahoga, Hamilton, they were competing for number one, but I think Franklin, we only have spent 14% of the pandemic relief that American Rescue money that Elizabeth mentioned, 14% of, of that money that was allocated for rent assistance has been spent. Um, it's, it's a political discussion that we need to really address. It's not all oh, these poor folks without housing. No, this is how we are funding things in the future. Joe is always talking about, Mayor Modal always talks about um, the, the, uh, the, the, the abatements that go about and, and how taxes are lost uh, annually of how we, we could fund social justice issues. And, and, um, so Elizabeth and Winnie, did you have any other uh, 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 ways of access points that you, you're, you're finding? Because you're dealing with this on the raw end of things, but you, there are some access points that might be able to be identified and say, oh, so so-and-so in the mayor's department or so-and-so at this council or so-and-so at this corporation um, what are you finding? Um, I call it political scientists call it a power structure analysis. What, so who, who is holding the keys to, to the, the kingdom that uh, could open up a lot DeWine. of resources for housing? DeWine? DeWine is one for sure. Yeah. Why not put pressure on him? Yeah, yeah. it's also the, uh, the, I mean, truthfully, uh, the main contact for the city for homeless camp outreach is the Department of Development. I think that's that's important and more people should realize that, that they are, if you contact the city regarding a, an unhoused encampment, they will inevitably send you to, um, to, to Emerald with the Department of Development. Um, but I, I really would love to, uh, Emily is on the call now, um, Emily Myers from Here to Serve, they, uh, they serve Pier Park on the south side, the, um, the other camp that got a lot of coverage recently when it was swept. And I'd love it if Emily could speak uh, to- Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, Emily uh, uh, is, is now with us and I saw she jumped on. So please, if you wanna join in this conversation, please do. Hey, absolutely. I am so sorry, my camera is broken. So <laughs> um, you just get my voice for now. But we just finished up serve, um, so I had to come home and jump on the Wi-Fi. Uh, I was just kind of listening to Elizabeth um, and talking about Camp Shameless. So we are located on the far south side for people who don't know. Um, we are near here Park, which uh, we were evicted last month um, pretty violently by the city. Um, and so... Right now, we're just kind of trying to do the same thing. Our camp was already um, basically a community when we started doing this work about two years ago. So, you know, when you ask about who holds the keys to the kingdom, um, I have been trying to do this work for quite a few years. And I would say, honestly, you know, 
Emerald is the person that they send out. Emerald is the person that does a lot of the paperwork. Um, but her boss, uh, Matt, what's Matt's last name? I can get everybody the emails because there's like a million, but her boss is some, it's like one of the people that really pulls the strings and then city council. So I'm sure Joe's already told you like city council and the mayor and the developers are all in bed together. And so when you look at, when you look at the money that's being given away to developers, I mean, we've lost over 51 million just in 2021 to, you know, these tax abatements. And so, you know, the space that we were on that was evicted was owned by Casto and Casto is a pretty notorious rough developer here in Columbus. They own a lot of land. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're making money hand over fist and they're displacing people. And what they're doing is they're hiring the Columbus police to work special duty to further traumatize folks. And when, you know, you ask where are people supposed to go, like, what are their options? Then they just send them to community shelter board, which again, eventually goes back to Emerald. So it's, <laughs> they end up just putting you in a vicious cycle. So we have not, like we can't even get a company to put porta potties out for us because we don't have an address. And where our camps are located now, it's a crisscross between private property, metro parks and city owned. So they're all kind of fighting amongst themselves for now until they figure it out. Um, but our side of town is getting gentrified left and right. We're having developers come in and scoop up this land and none of our folks are getting into housing or getting any type of care. So like Elizabeth and them, you know, they're taking care of the residents there as best they can. We are doing the same, um, but we also have pets that are dumped pretty continuously. So we're having like more issues with trying to do population control now so that food isn't being eaten by hungry cats. Um, and we're trying to work with the trailer park residents because, you know, there's conflict. And, you know, Elizabeth said that when they, when people call and they're calling on the unhoused camp encampments, you're not just getting a hold of Emerald, you're getting a hold of Sergeant Danaher who is like the whole, he's over the entire neighborhood or the entire Columbus. Um, and so these complaints are actually going to the police and then the police are coming out and harassing folks. Um, so, you know, you're getting pushed by Zach Klein's office to, hey, if you see a house that's uh, got people living in it, and in their words, these are not my words, in their words, they're like, oh, people who are using drugs, like drug addicts and, you know, prostitutes. And if you call us, we can, we, we'll, we'll get them out. And I'm like, okay, so people who are unsheltered, people who are using drugs and people who are engaged in survival sex work. So then I'm calling the police to do what exactly? What happens to folks? Do you house them? And where do you house them at? you can't get any answers. There's no transparency. Oh, I'm sorry. Did somebody ask a question? Oh, no, it, <laughs> you know, I don't think so. But Emily, thank you. Uh, with your your story, uh, south side and, and then the west side, and then also Elizabeth's on the east side. We know this is a citywide concern and, and a, a countywide concern, statewide concern, national concern, world concern because there's more displaced people, internally displaced people. And I, you know, that's the way we can almost look at some of these folks that are um, house, houseless, um, without house, without shelter. Um, they're internally displaced. And we, we if you start talking internationally and, and the movement building, and that's sort of the discussion we're wanting to move towards is how to build a multinational, multiracial, multicultural movement to address housing health and, and, and the racist and classist uh, 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 struggle that we have. Um, so thank you, Emily and, and Elizabeth and Winnie and, and Gary in the background, I see him, he's there. Uh, Dave, I saw you on my, mic'd yourself. I don't know if you wanted to say something because I saw you had unmiked and I know you're, you're deep into all this conversation, but Emily, I didn't want to cut you off first. You go ahead, finish up what you were saying, please. 
Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Cause I got to get back. Um, I was just going to say, you know, that we work really hard to, you know, feel like a community and to make sure we're taking care of folks. We, we call it heart work. You know, we do a lot of heart work in trying to connect people back with their families. We have a lot of moms and dads who really miss their kids and, you know, pardon my French. I think that's why the city smells like such bullshit, especially this city, because they say they care about families and want to keep them together. And yet they continuously uphold systems that keep them apart. So, you know, that's, that's all we're trying to do, you know, is really put people back together and support them and, and, you know, be here as much as we can. And, you know, to your point, to the numbers, just real quick. I mean, we got 134, 135 million in American Rescue Plan funding, and none of that has been used for affordable housing. We are one of the only cities that has not used it for housing. And when you push for answers, it's just layers and layers of BS. And so, you know, I think, I think one of the things that will help is changing the zoning laws so that we can have these smaller homes that are less than a thousand feet, because currently that's a big barrier. You can't build houses that are less than that um, with the current zoning and the current code enforcement. So that is one thing that could easily be done that wouldn't cost really any money to, to change. So um, just throwing that out there before I hop off here. I really appreciate y'all for letting me be on here for talking about us and giving us some visibility. Yeah, th thank you, Emily and Elizabeth too. I, I think your words are very important. And if you could just spend some time in writing this down and getting it into the Free Press Network and, and maybe joining some of the radio shows that we have. We have WGR and WCRS. And, and start joining that conversation and, and really don't feel outsiders. You guys are a part of a community that is large and we need to understand how to support each other and, and really move towards uh, building a resistance towards the, the lack of, of concern. I don't know if, I, I don't know how to describe, you, you know, when you talk to the person, the mayor himself, he, he seems like he's really down with the people, you know, he really does. But his policies are totally counter to it all. I mean, I work for, work for the city and we see how much we had to struggle just for to get the, uh, 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 the money for when we worked during the pandemic. We had to fight like hell for it. Mm -hmm. Excuse my language, Stephen, I'm sorry. Um, so Elizabeth, uh, Emily and, and Dave, or anybody else, that, and, and Wendy for sure, please. Winnie is one of our board members, and she brought this to us as a very important, uh, timely concern for this salon. And we really want to make sure that we're amplifying this voice uh, of concern and, and, and really resistance, more than concern, resistance to what the city uh, uh, is planning. And, and they're planning to sweep people away. I, I work on the south side. I, I've, I've seen many camps get moved on. But then the local residents also have some concerns as well about safety and other things that are going on. And the camps can't be a permanent solution in states like Ohio. It's a little too cold. You know, it's not like a, we are California yeah. or Florida, you know, yeah. like where the winter could possibly be spent uh, outside, yeah. but the people will be freezing to death. Yeah, it could be deadly. It could be deadly. So yeah, yeah camps are, are, so are band-aids. Yeah, so I'm just wondering at the, whether the, there should be more emphasis on getting the money, you know, out of the clothes of, you know, the city and the state government. You know, they have received money from the federal government. They have they have it. They, they need to spend it okay. on the right people. Right. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the, you know, maybe the camps should be on, on the state house grounds. Yeah, maybe maybe uh you know Parkview and and uh, Maryland might need another yeah, camp. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> camp there until that uh, the line comes up with money. Uh, I don't know that that's uh, that, but you know Bexley police are fairly aggressive too. So mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, yeah, that's true. Hmm. Yeah, but so Elizabeth Emily, I know Emily, you you're trying to get off and and go do your work, but uh, you got some things you want to say before you get out of here. Yeah, city hall, but yeah, the big money is in the state though. Yeah, they already have it. And so elections coming up and, you know, strat strategically, it's probably better to focus on like making the uh, Republicans an evil guy. Hmm. You get so just, just real quick. I did want to say, um, 
the city of Columbus is working on a homeless docket so that they can uh, mandate certain things. So it is about to be 100% very illegal to be unsheltered here. It's currently a felony in Tennessee, and that's like the direction that we're moving towards. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, is this to be legislated by uh, Shayla's office? Uh, it's it's coming out of the um, Department of Development first, but we've heard about it in other in area commissions, um, in other meetings. There's been talk of again the the homeless docket, which would criminalize homelessness further and make it easier for these groups to institutionalize people to to compel them into institutionalization. Yeah, the neighborhood associations are definitely feeling the stretch of a policy that is beyond them. And, and they are reacting in a way that uh, what property owners do, you know, they mm -hmm. like, you're going to be messing with my property. So, you know, that kind of thing. So um, thank you, Ronald and Will, I know you have some, uh, some, uh, so why don't we go with Ronald first then Will? Um, Yep, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, I just wanted to mention Nicholsville. Your, they mic's, they your mic's messing up. Heard of Nicholsville. Hey, Ronald, can you like reattach yourself to this, you know, come back on and maybe the sound will be better. We'll get to Will first because your sound is really bad right now. <laughs> will, go ahead. All right, thanks. Um, I, I hate to be chewing up so much FaceTime here, but... Uh, uh, one of our members of the Columbus Community Bill of Rights um, became aware of this Columbus Charter Commission thing that you've given him some time, Bill Lyons, uh, over the last couple of salons. And I will tell you that throughout that process, watching how city government works is an absolute nightmare. Um, you know, as far as the development thing is concerned, that falls under Bankston's uh, responsibility on city council. And I can tell you that this guy, he has all the right things to say at all the right times. Uh, and I guarantee you, if you think that you're going to get some resolution out of this guy, you're wrong. You're going to have to bring uh, enough public pressure down on him to you know, really uh, hit, get him to sing the blues. Now, my second point is I'm a person who is a, a big fan of the concept of tiny houses. And I get a lot of information in a month's time about certain tiny house projects that are specifically set up for homeless people. And they're absolutely brilliant. I mean, there's, and, and not to, to mention the fact that, that economically, they are clearly superior to the amount that's being spent to deal with the problem today. Uh, you know, if we actually got out there and built these places and give some people a little bit of self-respect and so forth, and, you know, folks, a tent is no place to be uh, in this city during the winter. So... You know, we need to start having some compassion uh, and getting on these city officials or state officials, if you will, to, to, to you know, get rid of these old uh, laws that says that you can't build a tiny house because that is the key. I think, you know, it's building tiny house communities to where these people can live, where they can have, you know, uh, heat, cooling. Um, you know, all the, the basic things that, that we just expect in our daily lives. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're just Let as me, entitled to them as, as, as anybody else. That would be so. an issue, but I don't think that it's a deep key issue. The key issue is ownership, I think. You know, who owns what? And who is monopolizing houses? We talk about unhoused people. Yes, unhoused people are there because some people are overhoused. Some people have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 11, 12, 13. <laughs> 20, 100 houses. They, ha they have houses, you know, to turn them into Airbnbs, BNBs, you know, like a short term rentals, you know, and all kinds of things, you know. That needs to be curtailed. Perhaps needs to be even banned, you know. That kind of thing should be on 
put on referendum, maybe some of the Airbnbs need to be expropriated and turn them into you know, housing for people you know, who currently do not have houses, right? You know, they can be tiny houses, yes, but they can be big houses. <laughs> I don't care about sizes. The, the question is a maldistribution of housing ownership. Some people have too many, some people have none. <laughs> you know, let's get the houses from people who have too many and, and give them to people who don't have any. I think that should be our goal. All right. The Thank city you. is Thank getting you. money and that's, from people. And that's Yoshi. Yeah. <laughs> right. David, the city is I, getting... I, yeah, David, we'll get you in two seconds. Winnie and Elizabeth had some stuff they wanted to say, and we'll get to you. Just hang on. Hang, remember, write that down. Don't forget it. So Michael just said, um, what What about the people who say not in my backyard? Well, at the Hare um, Park uh, sweep, um, a woman who worked for um, uh, Mary Haven said to the, to the activists, well, would you like them living in your backyard? And the answer is no, we don't. And we don't want, And but uh, on the other hand, the park, we pay, it's our tax money that we pay for the park. And quite frankly, Mary Haven is funded with tax money. So she's working for us. And we want her to do something um, with our tax money to take care of the citizens. And uh, so, you know, they, they have all, I, I just, my mind is just boggled by all the millions of dollars and they can't take care of 2000 homeless people and they can't prevent homeless people and the poor life outcomes and they can't provide medical care. It just, um, I mean, the, the high infant mortality rate and the eviction rate in the poor neighborhoods, in the hilltop, the Near East Side and Linden tells the whole story of the economic inequality and we, in 2017, we were second in the nation after Austin for economic inequality between the richest and poorest neighborhoods in Columbus. Um, and now I've heard it's dropped to a four, fourth in the nation, but we're still like fame, fame, epically inequal. And, and the, the thing that kills me is the ch infant mortality. And so this homelessness, people don't like to see it because it reveals the truth about the corruption in our government. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Elizabeth and then David. Uh, but uh, I, we're raising very good, important uh, uh, documentations of this, the, the problem. It's always very important when you're talking about organizing is that we establish a problem, yes, but then we have to get to an issue of what we can do. We'll move towards the targeted and that's why I say the key, the keys to the kingdom. We need to know where those are mm -hmm. to be able to to attack and go forward and target them specifically when we're campaigning. Go ahead, Liz. I'm sorry. No problem at all. Um, I I just wanted to say, you know, as as awful as it does sound, and as awful as it is to live outside in the winter here in Ohio, there's a lot of people that do it, and there's a lot of people that have to do it. Um, it's, I have met so many people over the time that I've been spending with the camp and many of them have spent many winters in Columbus living outside, you know, living, living in a parking garage somewhere because it's the best place to get out of the wind or sleeping in a bus stop. Um, I love the idea of tiny homes and that's one of the proposals that we've, we've presented and we've, we've discussed with the city is the the idea of building tiny homes within residential neighborhoods to be part of the community. But that's been such a huge part of Camp Shameless is the, the connection to the community. Uh, and I think that's really the key because so many of these projects, they, they push unhoused people into the suburbs or beyond the suburbs. They put these, these big structures far away from the resources that people have been accessing and they, they keep them far away from their jobs. They keep them far away because they do have jobs. There's, I know a lot of people at the camp that are gainfully employed as it were, but it's really hard to get an apartment when you just make $13 an hour on part-time wages. Yeah. Rent control, yeah. that's another issue. Yeah, the rent, rent control is hmm. very important. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you again, everybody. David, you got back on, I see. Do, did you want to? Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, it seems like uh, Elizabeth covered some of it. I mean, we we did 
propose a tiny home um, plan to the city to which Sheila's favor, after 45 minutes of discussing it, said, well, we don't invest in tent cities, um, which meant that she missed the entire point of what we were talking about. Um, and of course, the issue with rent control is that it has now been outlawed across the state in a late night um, legislative run at the end of their session this last time. I mean, I'm, co I'm, I'm part of the executive committee for the uh, Coalition for Rent Control, and we're collecting signatures now to essentially set up a tenants union. But what I think I've found, and, and we've found this um, in years of organizing many of us on this call, that when there's a citizen initiated thing, the city of the state finds a way to kill it, uh, reshape it in something that is completely superficial, and then say, hey, problem solved. Um, which if you're getting as an elected official all of your money or most of your money from large developers, large um, energy companies, insurance companies, et cetera, you're not, uh, you're not incentivized to help the most vulnerable because that's not where you're getting your money. Yeah. So true. So as a community, we are a, a media public, public, uh, public media community where we are activists. And we need to uh, continue to use our infrastructure to put this word out that things are happening in the city. And we're we wanting to create a whole new world, a whole new world, a whole new world is possible, as they say. Uh, and, and we need to understand how local politics are played out on a global sense. We have the <laughs> When when Elizabeth mentions that they're trying to push the folks out to the to the suburbs, that's been international for years. I mean, that's been decades, almost millennial probably, of how the rich took over downtowns and the the poor were pushed out, and that's what we're seeing. We you we were opposite the U.S. for so many years, decades. We let the decay of downtown go. And, and the rich folks moved out, out, out. Urban sprawl was a, a common concept of that. Now the rich folks are wanting to come back to the city and, and they're kicking the poor folks out to the, to the dead suburbs, which have no, no, no services. You talk about bus service, you know, you may have one bus a day that goes in and one bus out. Uh, they're cutting quota and they're, services and quota that, uh, is now in the discussion, as Yoshe is saying, of cutting services. Um, during the pandemic, it was free. Yeah, it was. Thank you, thank you, little whatever for that. But they are now in the in in the restructuring mode of trying to cut services and trying to figure out that their their sustainability, quote unquote, in their minds. Um, so we have transportation, you know, we, we start talking about uh, ownership when we get into housing, we start getting about um, uh, with health care, we, we start getting into lar larger discussions of what does that mean, you know, the poverty rate is strongly related to medical. Um, mm -hmm. So social determinants of health. Yeah, it, it's determination towards where this society is moving, right? So uh, anybody, we're, we're at 8.30. We, we'll probably try to keep going for about another 15 minutes if folks want to hang on. We're still with Hello. about 19 yes. people. But yeah, um, who's... Hello. Up? Where yet? Oh, Ronald, you're back. Thank you. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, you're better now. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention Nicholsville. Has, has anybody ever heard of Nicholsville in Seattle? A mm, little bit. Not much about it, but... Go ahead. I uh, what when I used to watch it on, uh, on Democracy Now, it looked like a, a solution. But then, <clears throat> then Seattle, uh, then a developer wanted to buy the land, and they kicked the people off, and uh, they didn't allow it to relocate. And uh, I knew somebody who worked 
at the Columbus Shelter Board and they invited me to a fundraiser. And uh, before she, they introduced me to Ileana, her supervisor, I said, oh, I want to talk to her about Nicholsville. And she said, no, 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 don't do that. Nicholsville is a failed model. And I was like, why? Why was that? A fit? They, it was a, a tent village. They had their own security. They had porta potties. And the only problem they had, they did not own the land that they lived on. And a real estate developer wanted to uh, sell the, to buy the land. And this is like what we got to. Um, it's, it's like uh, Elizabeth said, they, uh, or somebody said they tent, uh, tent buildings are not an option or something like that. I don't know. No, it's not a final call. It's not the final call. We, what we really, these are tent cities are methods yes. to house people in not, the immediate not state. Ends. In the immediate yes. state. Not, it's not the final call. It's not, it's not where we're heading as, as yeah. a movement. It's I a would good say. pressure campaign. Yeah. yeah. And actually it's great, great political campaigning mm. uh, of creating uh, crisis points, which are these camps, they're crisis points, if you really think about mm. politics. And so okay, we're here now. What are you going to do with this? What are you well, going to do? I'm this? glad. And they've I'm gone to... towards sweeping. They've gone towards sweeping. I'm glad to hear about the the village on refugee in Hamilton, the small, uh, the tiny home village. That seems like the only answer, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, one that you mentioned. Yeah. Go ahead, Elizabeth. You mentioned oh. the GoFundMe thing, and go ahead. Yeah. Well, one one critique I, w I have of Vista Village is that it is a is a large development project. Um, it's it's one of those one of those projects that will cost a lot to serve you know a fair number of people, but there's a lot more people that need that sort of help. And so I think there are smaller scale transitional housing projects that don't necessarily have to come from a giant team of lawyers and developers that the city already works with um, hand in glove, but I, I think that there are other uh, community-driven solutions like what we're trying to propose and what we're working with the city on. Um, there's, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of options um, and I think we should explore as many of them as possible because clearly what's happening now isn't working. Um, if, if you look at the community shelter board's results, if you look at their interactive data, you can see a, a success rate that varies from 16% if you look at the whole county to um, occasionally you can get it up to about 35%. And what they're saying there is that 35% of the people who go through their program have moved into some sort of transitional housing. It, it's, it's unclear and the data is pretty sparse, but it's, it's safe to say that what they're doing isn't, isn't working for the vast majority. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to take liberty and we're going to do a little, uh, uh, advertisement in a way. So, um, Mary Jane Borden, you're on. Are there updates that you want to give us? Pat Marita, you're on. Any updates you want to give us? And and and, <coughs> and, 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 and I guess Charles wants to give us a big cough up or whoever that was. I don't know who that was. That was somebody. My fault. I it thought wasn't my you, Charles. Was off. It wasn't you, Charles. Sorry. It wasn't you. It I'm wasn't. It was not you. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so uh, Mary Jane, anybody? You got to unmute Mary Jane. Mary Jane, Mary Jane. And then Elizabeth, we'll get back. We'll get back. Sorry, I unmuted myself. Okay, my beat has always been cannabis, marijuana. Uh, so the biggest thing going on there is that a federal bill to legalize cannabis has been introduced in the United States Senate. Now, it's already passed, you know, at least a bill has already passed the uh, U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, for the bill introduced in the Senate, I think it's it's going to be interesting because it's probably just performative and a little more than that because of the, the famed filibuster. Nonetheless, um, here's to hoping. 
So what I did was I put together uh, actually a list I'd used in another article that I'd written, but I wanted to devote it to people who might want to write letters to uh, Senator Schumer, Schumer, I mean Schumer, uh, to encourage passage of this bill. So uh, I think I called it uh, what did I call it? Um, anyway, I uh, put it out there. Um, uh, earlier in the week and Suzanne posted on the free press uh, homepage and you can see it there you could go to it on by the link um, so that's mostly my update right now it's, things are kind of in the marijuana world a little bit quiet there's not going to be much going on in Ohio until after the first of the year and uh, nationally of course we've got so much else going on that the marijuana topic usually gets you know buried under a lot of other news but that's what I got for you tonight thank you Mary Jane uh, Pat do you want an update on uh, the nuke stuff, you know, how House Bill 6 continues to be in the media, and Pat Morita and her clan have been so deep in, in trying to bring this to, to the fore. Um, did anything, I know there's some stuff going on uh, beyond that and, and, and the Ohio nuclear. We have Piketon that is uh, finally getting shut down and cleaned up. Suppose, I mean, you can't clean up what they did down there, but um they're talking about cleaning it up and all that stuff so pets i don't know if she's around yet or not but and then um sandy did you want to talk anything about uh uh, uh your issues many many i know <laughs> yeah i'm gonna i just said i'm putting a chat right now there's an event coming up um dennis kucinich i'm pulling the plug on first energy and um, it's this Tuesday. Um, I just put up there Tuesday, August 23rd, not this Tuesday, but August 23rd. If you want to sign up for it from Move to Men. And of course, for those who are not aware, Move to Men is working on an amendment um, to, to abolish the idea that corporations are people and money is speech. Um, we're also, um, our local group will be meeting soon. Um, we're looking to... Um, um, perhaps <laughs> um, be part of the um, the um, best of, what's the event coming up in September? Um, hot times. Hot times. Thank you, Will. And um, we're looking at setting up a tent for that. If this interests you, um, you can be part of it. If you're not familiar with Move to Men or would like to know more about it, you can still um, just put me, you know, um, put your name in the chat for me. And I'll in uh, a way I I can get hold of you, or I'll put my email here. You can get hold of me that way, um, and it'd be a way for you to just come join us at Hot Times and learn more about what we're about. And um, and that's it. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Sandy. And yes, and and uh, continue to work with Kucinich. He he's one of the uh, Ohio's best politicians that mm -hmm. I've come across over the years. <laughs> Uh, Pat, you're back. So do you want to maybe give up a little update on, on all this craziness that's going on? You know, Colum Ohio has become a, a notorious for, uh, insanity. for insanity in a lot of ways, but uh, corporate uh, heist in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. you know, corruption. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're starting to become known in, mm -hmm. in the state, in, in the nation, in a lot of bad ways. So, okay, Pat, please. Yeah, so, well, <clears throat> in the nuclear world, uh, the, the Portsmouth nuclear site, which is the official name of, the, of that 4,000 acre site down at Piketon, Ohio, um, the, that so-called cleanup is um, spreading a lot of radioactivity around. Uh, the Department of Energy, uh, when, it was, when it had the gaseous diffusion plant down there, they brought in really high level radioactive waste and ran that through a, a plant that was just supposed to have um, uranium uh, and enriching uranium. And so the place is contaminated with transuranics and technetium and all kinds, all ilks of radioactive material down there. And um, the best kept secret is that this is turning into one of the nation's largest war making uh, machines down there. They have a, a new um, centrifuge enrichment that's going on, and they have using the depleted uranium from the old from the um, old uh, well the waste from the enrichment 
depleted uranium and they are using that now they're making weapons out of it so there's a new line down there that is going to convert that depleted uranium into weapons uh, and then they are there's also a, a nuclear power plant that's being subsidized down there uh, it's not got any um, legs on the ground yet but there's a lot of money in, invested in this new nuclear reactor uh, and then then they want to build a hydrogen plant down there. Well, these fancy new hydrogen plants aren't green. They're using natural gas, getting the hydrogen off of methane. That's one thing. Or else they are finding a use for uh, like nuclear power plants or other industries uh, to use so so-called waste heat uh, to <clears throat> uh, to make hydrogen. But these are industries that shouldn't exist in the first place. And we don't want to use their waste heat. We want to shut them down. So speaking of shutting, I will shut up now. And uh, thanks thanks to all you know, nukers. Yeah, Pat, never shut up. Never shut up. Uh, Joe, Mayor Joe, Botel, and then we'll get back to uh, Will and, and Elizabeth. We'll, we'll sort of bring this discussion. Uh, what, what are the best motions that we can do in the next two, three weeks so because we are facing that serious deadline. So uh, let's see, where, where'd you go? Where you so where you at? Joe. Right here. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> you, were up on, you were up on the left side, and now you jumped over to the right side. My bad. <laughs> just a real quick announcement for everybody. I just found this out uh, last night at the, the uh, outdoor uh, second Saturday salon that uh, Lieutenant Melissa McFadden is going to be promoted to commander uh, this Friday at 10 a.m. at the police academy on uh, Hague Avenue. And as many of you know, she wrote the book, uh, Walking the Thin Blue Line, Black Line, and exposing the disparities and corruption that occurs in the Columbus Police Department. Uh, that took a hell of a lot of guts, as you all know, and uh, she stuck her neck out there. And uh, so she is finally being promoted to uh, commander this Friday. It's open to the public. Uh, we're trying to get as many people out there as possible to uh, uh, you know, congratulate her. So if you got Friday open, 10 a.m. Police Academy, uh, she'd like to see you. Thanks. Yeah, great, great facility. Go see what your taxes were spent on. Um, Will, do you, do you, you've had your hand up for a little while. Um, oh, that was 10 minutes ago. How could I possibly remember that? <laughs> That's why I tell you to write down. I keep telling <laughs> people that we are, we are a newspaper. You need to write yep. down. Now, folks. I'm taking notes. Trust me. <laughs> hey, real quick. Uh, and this goes to Mary Jane. Uh, as I have said before, I'm on day eight of COVID and um, it has not been a very pleasant ride for me. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. talking about six full days that I couldn't sleep because I've got the brain fog, which mm -hmm. is one of the, uh, the symptoms of, of COVID. Uh, so somebody had gifted me some THC tincture. And I dropped six drops of that underneath my tongue last night. And I had one of the best nights sleep I could have ever imagined. And I'm telling you folks, I, I was, I'm a pro cannabis guy in the first place, but that, that's, that was just unbelievable. I eat, you have no idea. And I, here I am, I'm blowing my mouth <laughs> during this thing. It's because this is the first day where I've, where I've actually felt like I was human again. Uh, so I'm riding quite a high. Anyway, uh, last, last thing. <laughs> in many different directions. Yeah. Yes, yes, in, in, in several different ways. Uh, my last point, though, is that having, being involved with the Bill of Rights groups for the last several years, I have, it, it has become very apparent to me that getting people to, to get activated uh, is like pulling teeth. I mean, it, it, you know, people are so concerned with their own lives and so forth and getting them you know, uh, behind things. And, th and, and the stuff that we're talking about tonight is just vitally important. What I'm saying to you is that in the last, this last uh, primary election, one of our very own, Carolyn Harding, uh, was running in a, uh, a district, state district uh, for state representative against an incumbent, a Democrat incumbent, and she got 35% of the vote. And I'm telling you, folks, that's a sign that maybe people are waking up 
it's time for us to get on our bicycles and get people like Joe Motil uh, elected to, to, to mayor of this city. And, and we start having some, some uh, you know, some influence on these Columbus politicians that are just, they're just evil folks. So that's, and that will be my final sp statement for the night. Y'all have a good night. I will. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can't call anybody evil, but they, they are. Their 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 butter their bread is buttered on one side that we know which it is. So they're.